Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's computer science at ISTS Colloquia. Uh, this is, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome John DeLong from the NSA uh, as part of our security surveillance and big data uh, series that with the age of big data and large amounts of computing and the way it interacts with every aspect of society creates a lot of uh, challenges and opportunities and needs for discussion for uh, that relate right to uh, security, technology, and society, exactly the mission of our institute. Uh, so John's going to talk about national security applications. John is married to a Dartmouth alum, but he did his work at some Ivy League place down in Massachusetts. Uh, uh, and, uh, the Dartmouth of the South. Yes, the, the Dartmouth of the South. And, uh, and uh, uh, with the law degree there as well. Uh, so without further ado, let me welcome John DeLong. Great. Thanks. Um, so by my calculations, we have a, a little over an hour. Um, I'm going to try to confine my remarks to a little over half that, leaving plenty of time, I really hope, for... Oh, I've got to turn it on. Okay. Operator here, this is what I How did I do? Great. Okay. Hi, I'm John DeLong. Um, I, uh, so we have about an hour. I'm a little over that. Um, and I'll try to keep my remarks to about half an hour and then um, leave some uh, um, time um, for discussion. So. A uh, quick agenda of what I want to talk about. One is, um, first of all, to say thank you all for being here. Um, thanks to Dartmouth and ITIS and the Dickey Center and the Computer Science Colloquium for having me here. Um, thanks for putting me as part of the speaker series. Uh, and, um, you know, initially at, at June of last year, um, a lot of us at NSA were out in the media, the media, the media. Um, and that was um, unique in many ways. Uh, and we've shifted now. Um, to a place that I really do enjoy. I enjoyed the media, but I also enjoy this very much, which is time um, to have a real discussion, um, communicate some things, and, and hear from all of you about the issues that Sean talked about. Um, so uh, technology, society, um, security, um, international understanding, to bring in the uh, Dickey Center um, description, I think, you know, those, just those names and of themselves are, are great to put together. Uh, so like I said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, I'll just tell you a little bit of my history, just so you know a little bit. Uh, um, Sean talked about it. I then I'm going to go all the way back. I'm just going to write a few things on the board. I'm going to go back to 1874 in St. Louis. Um, don't worry, there's method to the madness here. Um, I'm then going to fast forward to 2014 um, at the NSA. Um, and then I'm going to go back to 2014 in St. Louis. And. Uh, um, you may wonder, what is this guy going to talk about? But I hope you'll find that um, this will help us explore uh, big data, surveillance, architecture, privacy, compliance, all those things that we really do care about. We need to have a discussion. Um, and then I want to get into some of the current discussions. A couple of folks have asked me to talk about, um, and I certainly will, the uh, various programs that were out there, the telephony metadata or call records, not the voice calls, but just the, the to and from, and some of the um, some of the restrictions on that, kind of how the compliance regime works on the director of compliance. So that's an area I know well. Um, I was shocked and awed to see that court order come out in June. Um, I have two computers on my desk. One's classified, one's unclassified. I'm used to seeing that on the classified side. I suddenly saw it on the unclassified side. That was, that was quite a memorable day. Um, and then uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of um, uh, what I see as some of the great architectural, engineering, and computer science challenges. Um, with respect to this topic. And I, and I really think it's important to think of that um, as challenges and opportunities. So first of all, let's go back uh, just a little bit about me. Um, as uh, Sean said, I, I started in math and physics. Um, I did not have a tie on then. Um, I, uh, I then went to the NSA, did a lot of crypto work um, in mathematics and, and um, related areas, a lot of computer science and programming. Um, you don't spend a lot of time in the government without spending time with policymakers, with lawyers, et cetera. Um, you know, it is a very regulated place. Um, it's very different from a private sector, even person or organization. In the government, you can only do what you've been authorized to do, and that will be a theme I'll pick up a little bit. But because of that, you're in constant communication um, with the policymakers, with the internally, externally, and the lawyers to make sure you're understanding what the bounds are. Well, that got me interested enough in what these lawyers and policy folks were doing. Um, so I decided to go to law school. Um, and ever since then, I've been in um, kind of the mix, the, the glue, if you will, between law and policy, between technology, between the actual activities we conduct, 
which is probably the easiest way to describe what a compliance officer does or what a director of compliance does, which is to not build the technology, not actually conduct the operations, not even in the first instance set what the rules are, but keep all of those acting together consistently each and every day. So that's my role. I've been in this role since 2009. I'll recount some of my experiences. But let's take a quick trip back to 1874 in St. Louis. Um, and uh, I know some of you are scratching your heads thinking, what does 1874 in St. Louis have to do with big data and privacy and surveillance? But let's get there. Um, so this is a story about a bridge. Um, does anybody know what bridge I'm referring to? Eads. Yes, the Eads Bridge. Right, so the Eads Bridge is a bridge across the Mississippi. Um, it uh, connected um, the two sides of St. Louis. Uh, it was built, as I said, in, in 1874. Um, it, uh, it, at the time, was a completely new and novel bridge. Uh, it turns out, at the time, it was the longest um, single span um, uh, bridge, longest arch bridge, almost 2,000 meters. Um, it, was, it involved steel, which at the time was um, in bridge building, um, not uniquely um, something that was um, something used all the time. It involved cantilevers, right, the idea that you could potentially right, go out into space and not see a support underneath you. Um, it involved some deep water uh, um, anchoring that actually um, caused some people to get a tremendous amount of bends. Anybody a diver in here? Um, so there was a lot going on with this bridge. Um, at the time, actually, steamboats didn't want this bridge to be built because it was going to interfere with them. So they imposed all kinds of restraints on this bridge. It had to be so and so high. It couldn't right, um, impede their progress. Um, the state and local municipalities were really trying to make this difficult. Um, and so actually, um, Jim Eads said, uh, uh, well, I'll get to what Jim Eads said. but." If you read these stories about the Eads Bridge, they will say it very clearly. These constraints resulted in a bridge noted as innovative for precision and accuracy of construction as quality control. So despite all the difficulties, this bridge came out with flying colors. Walt Whitman even went to visit it, declared it a structure of perfection. Um, and today, there's still engineering and, and other groups that go and they look at this bridge. Because at the time, it really was, and it still is today. Um, over 100 years later, still standing, still used. Right? And even Jim Eads itself said, we must admit that because a thing has never been done, or must we admit, asking the question, because a thing has never been done, can it never be done, when our knowledge and judgment assures that it is entirely practical and possible. And in fact, the Brooklyn Bridge was modeled on the Eads Bridge, and so it actually launched a tremendous amount of bridge building and bridge um, uh, work going forward. And for all its goodness, right, it wasn't perfect, obviously. If you look into the deep thing, the initial steel structures were a little bit, failed some initial quality control. They had to work on them. But for all its greatness, it had a huge issue, which is no one would go across it. Right? No one would go across it because they didn't believe that even it would support a human, right? much less an automobile, much less, I don't know if they had tractor trailers in the time, much less a train. Right? Nobody would go across it. And so the builder, Carnegie, actually of the steel industry, um, was really in a dilemma. Right? He and his team had really tried very much to build something that was architecturally sound, that was built on sound design, quality control, right? that had sort of met every requirement that the government, that other folks had levied on him. But nobody would use it. Nobody felt safe. Nobody trusted it. Does anybody know what he did? I went to law school, so I always like, you know, I've, I've loved to like be a Socratic method type thing. I'm just kidding. Um, trying to liven up the room here a little bit. Uh, does anybody know what he did? He walked across it. He did not. He, he himself walked across it, but nobody sort of, right, they, they were worried that, okay, maybe it was a person, but. Before he did that. So he eventually did take a 13 trains. Yes? Elephant. An elephant. Excellent. <laughs> right? So this is, this is great. This is, you know, people talk about the elephant in the room, and you're probably all thinking a guy from NSA. He's going to talk about the elephant in the room, and I'm, but no, I'm really going to talk about an elephant. Um, and uh, so what he did was he realized that, that um, there is this legend, or maybe belief, that, that elephants have a unique sense to detect when ground is safe or unsafe, firm or unfirm. And that an elephant, right, devoid of any influence from people or, or bribes or anything, right, would, 
you know, maybe you could put a peanut on the other side and the elephant might run across. But they didn't do that. And what they did was he contracted with the circus and he brought in an elephant and he paraded the elephant across the bridge. And after that, enough people believe that, of course, an elephant being heavy, one thing, but also an elephant as uniquely understanding and knowing what was firm and unfirm ground. And after that, he paraded 13 steam locomotives across. He paraded eventually. There was a set of people 13 miles long that walked across the Eads Bridge. So just hold that thought. I'm going to talk about the elephant when I get to the end of my presentation. How do you know the elephant? That's amazing. I was just helping you out. Wiki, wiki, oh. <laughs> I've heard of that. Yeah. yeah. That's great. This the power of modern technology. Wrong. Oh. Yes. All right. So let's go. So that's that's St. Louis, um, the Eads Bridge, right? A, a, a true modern marvel, a true new thing that was brought. The ability to cross that amount of span with that height, with a fewer number of pilings so the ships could get through. 2014, NSA. So it's no secret that NSA has had review group after review group come through over the past year. I don't think there's a day that I have not met with a review group or other folks. It's been a fascinating time. Right? Um, and so one of those review groups was the presidential review group composed of five um, folks from across a variety of academic and former governmental experience. One of them was Professor Jeffrey Stone of the University of Chicago. Um, he was part of that review group. They finished a report. It was 304 pages. I've read every page. Um, I would instruct you to look at page 199 in case you're reading it. It's a great section on compliance. Um, but nonetheless, that's not what I'm here necessarily to talk to you about. I'm here to talk to you about what um, Professor Stone did after they finished that. He came over to the NSA and um, gave remarks to the NSA personnel. He then, the day after, posted his remarks on um, a variety of websites. And I want to just, instead of you hearing from me about the NSA, I thought we'd just hear for a second about what Professor Jeffrey Stone told the NSA um, in March of this year, 2014. So again, these are not my words. This is uh, Jeffrey Stone. From the outset, quoting Jeffrey Stone, I approach my responsibilities as a member of the review group with great skepticism about the NSA. I am a longtime civil libertarian, a member of the National Advisory Council of the ACLU, and a former chair of the board of the American Constitution Society. To say I was skeptical about the NSA is, in truth, an understatement. I came away from my work on the review group with a view of the NSA that I found quite surprising. Not only did I find that the NSA had helped thwart numerous terrorist plots against the United States and its allies since the years since 9-11, since but I also found that it is an organization that operates with a high degree of integrity and a deep commitment to the rule of law. Like any organization dealing with extremely complex issues, the NSA, okay, NSA on occasion has made mistakes in the implementation of its authorities, but it has invariably reported those mistakes and worked consciously to correct its errors. The review group found no evidence that the NSA had knowingly or intentionally engaged in unlawful or unauthorized activity. To the contrary, it has put in place carefully crafted internal procedures to ensure that it operates within the bounds of its lawful authority. It gradually became apparent to me that in the months after the release of information about the government's foreign intelligence activities, the NSA was being severely and unfairly demonized by its critics. Rather than being a rogue agency that was running amok, the NSA was doing its job. Of course, quote, I was only following orders, end quote, is not always an excuse. But in no instance was the NSA implementing a program that was so clearly illegal or unconstitutional that it would have been justified in refusing to perform the functions assigned to it by Congress, the President, and the Judiciary. Although the review group found that many of those programs need re-examination and reform, none of them was so clearly unlawful that it would have been appropriate for the NSA to refuse to fulfill its responsibilities. Moreover, to the NSA's credit, it was always willing to engage the review group in serious and candid discussions about the merits of the program. To be clear, and this is important to follow up on the bridge and the elephant, thank you, sir. To be clear, I am not saying that citizens should trust the NSA. They should not. Distrust is essential to an effective democratic governance. The NSA should be subject to constant and rigorous review, oversight, scrutiny, checks and balances. The work it does, however, it does, however important to the safety of the nation, necessarily poses grave dangers to fundamental American values, particularly if its work is abused by persons 
in positions of authority. If anything, oversight of the NSA, especially by Congress, should be strengthened. The future of our nation depends not only on the NSA doing its job, but also on the existence, listen carefully, of clear, definitive, and carefully enforced rules and restrictions governing its activities. End quote from Jeffrey Snow. All right. So bridge. Skepticism. Jeffrey Stone. Skepticism. Understanding. Skepticism. Okay. So now let's go to 2014 in St. Louis. Probably wondering what I'm doing now. And you can't look it up on Wikipedia. It's not on there. <laughs> <laughs> trying to liven up the room. All right. Um, so in 2014, in St. Louis, in the Washington University School of Law and, and Washington U University of Washington, um, two professors wrote an article called Big Data Ethics. I realize I'm doing a little bit of reading, but I, I do want to cover just three paragraphs of that um, article. And again, this is not me. This is, this is um, Neil Richards and Jonathan King. Um, anybody read this paper? Big data? Kind of. You know about it. You're currently searching it on Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> so some of you are Googling it, perhaps, or other things like that. Again, their words. We are on the cusp of a big data revolution in which increasingly large data sets are mined for important predictions and often surprising insights. The predictions and decisions in this, revelation, in this revolution will enable us to transform our society in ways comparable to the Industrial Revolution. We are now at a critical moment. Big data uses today will be sticky and will settle both default norms and public notions of what is, quote, no big deal, end quote, regarding big data predictions for years to come. In this paper, again, them speaking, not me, we argue that big data, broadly defined, is producing increased powers of institutional awareness and are a power that require the development of big data ethics. We are building a new digital society. And the values, think bridge, as I'm about to talk, we build or fail to build in our new digital structures will define us. Critically, if we fail to balance the human values that we care about, like privacy, confidentiality, transparency, identity, and free choice, with the compelling uses of big data, our big data society risks abandoning those values for the sake of innovation and expediency. In part one, we trace the origins and rapid growth of information revolution. That's like my bridge story. In part two, we call for the development of big data ethics, a set of four related principles. First, we must recognize privacy as an inevitable system of information rules, rather than just merely secrecy. Second, we must recognize that shared private information can remain confidential. Third, we must recognize that big data requires transparency. And fourth, we must recognize that big data may compromise identity. In part three, we suggest how we might integrate big data ethics into our society. Big data ethics are for everyone. All right, so again, we started in 1874 in St. Louis, building a bridge, skepticism, the elephant, building something architecturally in the design. Right, we went to 2014 inside NSA, Jeffrey Stone, recounting what he saw as a member of the Presidential Review Group with ability to look not just at what's been released in the public, but also at what still exists in a classified form inside NSA. And we went back to St. Louis, and I, have, I did not imagine that these two things would connect, but as I put together my talk for today, I realized that ironically we went from St. Louis to St. Louis. But St. Louis, two professors talk about big data ethics, and again, to re-quote what they said, we are building a new digital society, and the values we build or fail to build into our new digital structures are most important. All right, so I've been asked today to come and talk to you about um, big data sur sur surveillance in the era of big data, right? Talk about issues of technology and society, privacy, information security, talk about international understandings. Um, and so against this backdrop, that's where I'd like to um, continue a little bit over the next maybe 15, 20 minutes. Stop, take some, take some questions. Um, anybody have any questions at this point? Just to sort of set the context. We're all wondering about the elephant. Yes. Oh, I'd like to ask you <coughs> the sort of obvious question, which is, um, you know, given the whole um, 
you know, discussion about what Snowden did and, um, you know, playing Greenwald's um, publicity, basically, you know, publication of, of what happened. How, how do you feel in terms of, you know, the, um, the balance between sort of privacy, like my privacy and what I do, and the ability of, of the NSA to gather information on me when I actually have, you know, no connections with any terrorist groups. Um, I think my grandmother was in the IRA, the IRB, years ago. But, you know, what, what do you feel about that, that tension between civil liberty and the ability of, you know, of, of the government and NSA to stick information about me in some server somewhere that they may or may not look at? Just that threshold. Okay, so my answer to you is going to jump me 20 minutes in, but I'm going to do that anyway, all right? Because we're going to get there. Here's what I think. Um, one is I think it's great we're having this discussion. Right? This, is, this is a wonderful um, ability to have not just a collision of people, but a collision of ideas, right? These are not easy issues. Somebody once said, in this area, it's hard to know what's right. It's sometimes easier to know what's wrong. Um, and those are one of the things I think we'll, we'll, we'll find as we tease out. I will go back to something that... 2014 in St. Louis, which is, I think it's going to be increasingly important, and this is not just John speaking, this is, you see in, in the emerging literature, and actually you see in some of the 1970s legislation around foreign intelligence surveillance, where they basically said, you should think of protections of liberties and security, right, all that, as a series of information rules as a way the information is handled from the moment it's touched, the moments it's actually brought in, the moments it's looked at, the moment it's shared. And what I think the implications are in an era of big data is actually comes right back to me. Right? Because I think fundamentally in an era of big data, right, where there is data that is in an organization, where what's protecting it is a series of laws and policies, a series of rules, right? and we can t have a big discussion about right, whether we tweak them or that. There's a tremendous amount of reliance and trust and confidence that needs to be put in the compliance regime and the compliance program. Right? It amplifies that significantly. And because of that, and I'll get to my, again, I'm fast forwarding 20 minutes, but I'm glad you asked the question. Back to 1874, what I think we need to do as a group as a society, is figure out what is that elephant that we as society are going to be able to watch go over this bridge, right? This bridge that connects the rules with the actual operations of an organization like NSA. Because I don't think any of us, one second, yeah, I don't think any of us would say we don't want an organization that operates under the rule of law. We absolutely do, right? We want an organization that operates under the rule of law, the rule of policy that acts as an accountable organization. When the rules and the laws and the policy govern the totality of the handling of information, which is the way they did five years ago, the way they do today, it puts a tremendous amount of emphasis and energy and confidence right, on the ability of engineers, of computer scientists, of lawyers, to of compliance officers to architect into the system, into that bridge, if you will, enough safety, enough innovation, enough control to handle, and this is you getting to my metaphor, right? To handle the big 18 wheelers of big data, right, that are gonna go over that. And they're still going to be safe. Right? They're not gonna fall off the bridge, they're not gonna collide with somebody who's not, right, you know, to your point, somebody who's not connected somewhere. Right? But I if you look at where, for example, Neil Richards and um, Jonathan King are going, and again, this is just their view. Right, they're thinking of privacy, security, right, liberties, et cetera, as a set of information rules that govern the flow, the use, the handling, the collection, every stage of the process. But again, I think what it ultimately comes down to, once you get past the discussions or once you get through and, and align on something, it puts a lot of energy. Ben Wittes mentioned it. Compliance is a big part of the ballgame now. Right? Folks would be surprised to hear that there are 300 people working compliance at the National Security Agency. How many people knew that before they walked in the room? One, two. Yes, you did, because I talked to you. Right? 
And why do we have that? Because it is such a critical part of the ballgame. It is absolutely essential. And it's something we put a lot of energy into. And I'm happy to talk about kind of the different mechanisms we use, and I will talk about it with respect to some of the programs. But I think that's, that's the crux there. And, and what I, again, I realize it's a funny analogy about an elephant, but I wanted to you know, get past the elephant in the room. But there was something magical about that elephant that allowed a group of folks that were very distrustful, very skeptical. Right? I don't think anyone from NSA would say that NSA hasn't lost a lot of trust, hasn't lost a lot of confidence. Right? Some people didn't even know who NSA was. I still get questions when I talk to folks. Right? Who do you work for? NASA? No, I don't work for NASA. Um, my grandmother thought I worked for NASA. Um, she's passed away now, but um, she kept asking me when the space shuttle was taking off, and it took me about... <laughs> It took me about two years to figure out that she actually really thought I worked at NASA, and at that point it was just easier to go with the flow. Um, so, uh, but there's a lot of folks that their first exposure to the NSA was um, in June of 2013. I, I know it may be shocking, but there really were. There's a lot of folks that maybe thought we were a law enforcement agency and couldn't figure out how we were different from others. Um, and there's a lot of folks, obviously, that because of right, uh, a significant amount of heat and light that has come out, Confidence and trust is something. And confidence and trust is not something you, this talk is going to change in, in you know, an hour and a half. That's not going to happen. Um, a group of compliance folks said that confidence, I'm like basically going through my talk backwards now, but that's okay. Um, confidence is the residue of promises kept. Um, that's what it is. Right? And one of the things we're going to have to figure out is how do we move forward on that? How does, not just the three branches of government, but how does the public get enough insight such that they feel like they can watch that elephant cross that big data bridge, right? And then they can right, feel comfortable with other things crossing it as well. So that was a long-winded answer to your very simple question. Um, but hopefully it gave you a little bit of the perspective that we approach it from, which is in the information society, in a big data surveillance type society. Everyone has a different definition of big data. Let's just be really clear. Right? What's big data to one person is small data to another, depending on who you're talking to and et cetera. That's just, it's just one of those terms. Um, but regardless of the size of the data or the font we use, right, or the bold or the italics nature of it, um, the fact that we increasingly think of right, a series of rules that govern information as the key, it puts a lot of focus and energy on it. Can I just say one, just one thing? Though. Thanks for the answer. I was really good. But I don't care about big data. I, I care about my data. Small, I, I care about small data. So you know, that, that's, the, that's the issue here. Um, Right, and again, I think, you know, to, um, let's just go, let's walk really carefully through the telephony metadata program, which already telephony and metadata is not something that's easily accessible. Maybe easily accessible to the folks in this room, but it's not easily accessible um, to the general folks we're talking about. So the first thing that came out in, the, um, in June was um, an order that governed, right, a telecommunications company providing to the National Security Agency what was in the order as metadata, but it, it you know, increasingly further defined as not the voices in any call that was made to or from somebody, but the number that was called, that made the call, the number that received the call, the duration of that call, and the time of that call on this date, okay? But a lot of them. And, and that was the first thing that came out, right? Four pages. Did anybody read that order from cover to back? I did. Yes, great, right? That was it. A lot of collection coming into NSA. There was nothing in that order, and actually the title of it should have given people note. That, ti that or title of that order was the secondary order. It was the second order. The first order actually went to the government. And it said, when you receive this data, here's what you must do for it. Right? What, whether you want to call it big data or small data, your point's perfect. I might use it in future discussions, so I hope that's okay. You can put it on Wikipedia and say it was me. I'll cite to you somehow. I don't know how it'll work. Um, Right, whether you call it big data or small data, that data comes in to the government, to the National Security Agency, and it sits there. Right. There's no complex analytics running on it to right, detect patterns. It comes in and it sits. It sits. Until, and if you looked in the primary order, you would see, until an analyst inside the NSA who have a small group of them says, I have a telephone number, right, or a, a number that is telephony in nature, that is linked to an international terrorist organization, 
that's listed in the order that happened to be redacted part of it, so I'll just genericize that, but it's that. And if I can, with reasonable articulable suspicion, which means way more than a hunch, something a little bit less than probable cause, believe that that telephone number is linked to an international terrorist organization, I can ask a question of the database. And I can query that database, and I can receive back the numbers that that telephone numbers that that number was in contact with, and so on, all right? Up to two hops now, per the current order. It used to be three. It got changed in January 17th. And then that data then is looked at to detect, is there a connection somewhere either inside the United States or right, um, with a US threat to it to see whether that number needs to be then, and this is the important part, passed off through one of seven people to the FBI making sure that it was necessary then for the FBI to then follow up on that lead. So whether you want to talk about big data or small data, your data, for example, right, my guess is I, I don't know much about you other than you like to read Wikipedia. That's about all I know. Right? Um, but my guess is, for all intents and purposes, your data comes in and sits there. Right? Again, I'm just you know, playing hypothetical here. And each of those dips in is not likely to hit that. Now that is probably no small comfort Right, to somebody who has issues with, and again, the initial collection of that data. And that's where a lot of the discussion has been. Um, but again, it comes back to how much do you trust and have confidence in the compliance regime to follow those specific rules that govern the fact that only very specific queries can be made of the data. Right? Those queries are reviewed by a set of folks. Those queries are reviewed by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, a separate branch of government. How much do you have confidence in that? That, I think, is really the thing that turns whether the collection of that data, big data or small data, yours or anybody else's, mine, right? My data is probably in there somewhere. I don't know. Um, right? That's really, I think, where the crux is. You had a question first and then back there. Yes. All right. So you're, you're about to make a compelling argument that we should be okay with the existence of this whole surveillance infrastructure because of regulation and integrity of the agency. But so that's not my point right now. Okay, sure. But let's my point right now is your confidence in it depends both on what the rules are mm -hmm. and on your confidence in the compliance mechanisms to make sure those rules are being followed. Okay. That's my point today. So implicit in this whole, well, let's say, you know, making us sleep sound despite this whole infrastructure being there, um, is that we also need, well, from this follows that we should trust every future government and every future incarnation of the NSA with the existence of the surveillance infrastructure. So I will again quote Jeffrey Stone. Sorry, I, I, I know, I have to go backwards in time here. Not to, I won't go to 1874 and tell you about the elephant again. Um, right? Again, Jeffrey Stone, I'm not saying the citizens should trust the NSA, should not. Distrust is essential to effective democratic governance. The NSA should be subject to constant and rigorous review, oversight, scrutiny, checks, and balances. So that, that's part of the issue. But now I'm going to get to the second part, which is when you watch the presidential review group come through right, and write their report and write their recommendations, and if you listen to the president's speech on January 17th and the work that's been done since on the Hill, you'll see that the decision was made of not about current abuses or about current misuse of this database, which again, review group after review group found that actually the NSA had faithfully followed, been consistent with the protocols designed, but discussions about future potential abuse, right? a risk management calculus, a risk management discussion about all things being equal or taking into account the totality of the circumstances, should this database, should the collection of small data or big data, I like your point, sir, as to how you characterize this, small data or big data, should it be housed inside the government, or should it be left where it originated in the telecommunications providers, or even should it be put in a third party that might be some sort of mediator between the government and the telecommunications provider. And the recommendation, sorry, the recommendation, right, that was then, a study was done, and a, a, a decision was made to move the data outside of the government. 
right? Not because of current abuses, but because of the potential. Oh, for you like that are very tough to imagine. That, that Sorry, the what? The, 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 the better review, a constant review like that would be powerful enough, and under all circumstances, powerful enough to, to really bring in, say, a future rogue incarnation of, say, the NSA or a government or something. That's very hard to imagine in practice. If the infrastructure is there in the first place. So I think that's why, but maybe I'm missing your point. Uh, the okay. infrastructure you mean is what? It's the surveillance machine. So you have this big database. The ability to access it, or yeah. did you personally have it? A question, though. Sorry, I'm not allowed. Usually allowed to ask questions to the audience, but I did go to law school, so I can do the Socratic method. Um, so are you saying even once the database is moved outside the National Security Agency, well, there's still, still the same risk? So it would be potentially with the telecommunication providers. They hold it today. That's not new. Whoever is holding it is vulnerable, you know, from the inside as well as outside. Okay. I'm not sure there's a uniquely NSA answer to that. I think that's a bigger, that's a bigger U.S. government question. Or that it shouldn't exist in the first place. Or, or that it shouldn't exist in the first place. Those are the, but those are the big discussions, and I think that's where you're seeing the question. Sir. Yeah, it actually feeds into my uh, original question, right? So you have these uh, criteria for our trust, right? And it was trust in the people. I think there's a lot of good people who work at the NSA. Um, and trust in, there was some other stuff too, the two points, right? But one of them was, well, what about the trust in the technology of itself, right? So you could get hacked, you're a big target, if you distribute it, you could still maybe pick up who's communicating with whom. So other people could possibly use the machine. Maybe they get caught. But once the data's out there, it's out there, right? The internet's kind of a cop photocopying machine. Um, and there's a follow-on question for all of you. So I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to make sure I parse and understand your question correctly. Right, so again, just take the, the phone metadata. Right? So this, this, is, this is not, this stuff exists already in the telecommunication providers. For the phone metadata. Is this somewhere implicitly putting trust in the telecommunication? Right, you got to put trust somewhere, right? We are, at, at the end of the day, a democratic society That's where true. you can. Discuss where the trust being placed, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, I got, but I mean, are we talking specific to the telephony metadata? Or are we talking more general, big, huge issues of and is it, big government? I don't, I'm kind of fuzzy right now. I'm trying to okay. test this out. But the main concern is when, once you actually build this infrastructure, um, what guarantees can you really make that it's going to be used in accordance with law, even if the organization that built it has a lot of uh, evidence that it is, other parties could come along potentially and use it, even if you know, the NSA has, is doing its job completely. Okay, so I, I think, that, so I get this question sometimes, they kind of got it, right? We were willing to stipulate, let's just stipulate that an organization has got their act together, they're accountable, they're operating, and then somebody outside the organization comes in and says, we want you to do, we no longer want you to do A, we want you to do B. They don't say it, they, you get hacked. Oh, they get, we get hacked. I see, I see, I see. Well, I mean, I think you're then. It's one spill, right? And it could be bad because you have aggregated all this information. Right, so I think we're back to the general principles of computer security that sort of any organization faces. We do increase risk when anybody, any organization increases risk when they hold a large amount of data. It's true, but then do we have the technological maturity to create such systems without, you know what I mean? I, I do, and I think that's very much my, so I, I realize I went backwards through my talk and kind of have to go back forward. Yeah. Um, but I actually think, just like in 1874, the ability to design a bridge at that time that went 2,000 meters that was that high cantilevered, that could support that much weight, that had that critical quality control, that could then be proven, right? not just because of an elephant. An elephant's sort of the silly thing. Right? I mean, that's just an elephant. But there were other ways of proving over time, over change, that that, that architectural things were built into the architecture. I actually think, it was just John talking, is one of the great engineering and computer science and technology challenges of our time. Whether you believe there was a conscious or unconscious decision to go into big data and technology and secure, you know, have all those things, right? We are where we are. Um, not just, I'm not just talking about NSA, I'm just talking generally. And I actually think it's folks like the people in this room 
um, you know, back to uh, Richards and, uh, and um, Jonathan King, right, that big data ethics are for everyone. I think big data architecture, big data compliance, big data rules are for everyone. And it really is going to take, a, I really do think this is going to be one of the great, people will look back, and if we can do it as a society, and I'm not just talking about NSA, we can actually engineer accountable, provable systems that, Again, you can walk an elephant across and show people, right? And you can actually then drive big, heavy tractor trailers over them, and they still do fine. If you can do that, right? That is the great architectural challenge. Yes? Um, so I have kind of a, a question about the law, since that's something that I don't have a lot of personal experience with. Um, so the stereotypes that I have hold about Congress are not really that they're highly technologically savvy. <laughs> um, and, and maybe I actually harbor this kind of unkind stereotype about policymakers in general, that perhaps they're not people who are at the leading edge of understanding what can be learned from big data. And I wonder in this climate where potentially the time scale of innovation and machine learning research uh, is really outpacing the rate at which people are able to make sort of operational decisions about what our legal values are. How does this work, that these scales are very different? And how does, I mean, does compliance with the letter of the law get all the way to the currency of trust that you're talking about? Can it, can it keep up with the pace of technology? So that's a great question, um, and I, I, I do think, um, I'm not going to touch Congress. I'm just, that's, that, just going to talk about um, Talk about, um, um, you know, we, uh, we usually stick to the branch of the government we're in. That's sort of a good rule. Um, you know, they're, they're good folks. Uh, I get asked a lot, kind of, as director of compliance of the National Security Agency, what do you think about? You know, I get, it's usually what it keeps you up at night. It's usually our kids, really, is what keeps us up at night. But um, the, the, to use, to kind of echo back your comment, Asymmetry and understanding is something that a compliance officer in a compliance program sees as one of the biggest risks. Right? And, and actually, this goes back to, I'm going to draw on the board because I, I have a chalk and I have, a, I have this. Um, right? If you take a word and a rule and you take its technical implementation, right? um, the reality is, is you have to go through thought to kind of get to that. I use the word delete, for example. I used it in, at lunchtime. Right? If to a person that is maybe more in the legal policy world, they hear the word delete something, they think it's gone forever. To a computer, I'm in the computer science world here, right? Deleting a file on a computer means what? Removing a link, Removing a link maybe overwriting it with data, something like that. Right? Different, even already at the computer science level, at the engineering level, there's different ways to affect that word in technology. And what we spend a ton of time on is, is here's thought of a person maybe over in the regulatory space, right? somebody who's making the rules, and here's thought somebody who's actually implementing that rule. We spend a ton of time and have a ton of processes to make sure they arrive at the same destination. This path is imagined. This is what the rule, the regulator, says this is the intent of what I wrote. This thought over here is actual. This is what's actually changing in the technology and the operations. So the question is, I think what you're asking is, how do you keep, this, how do you keep these two things tight? Because if they diverge, right, that's, a, that's an issue. We do it a couple of ways. Um, we do it, one, by not treating documents that go out as merely legal or merely technical documents. We treat them as all of the agency's documents in the sense of, they go to legal, policy, technology, mission, compliance people. They all look at them, and they all look at them in a very careful way to make sure that from all perspectives, they're accurately reflecting what we're doing. We also try to shorten the loop by not just exchanging. People often think of laws and policies as paper documents flowing in and out of an organization. Right? What we actually do is we actually invite, and you heard this from the Presidential Review Group, we actually invite folks to come in and sit down with our analysts, see the technology, so they're not just looking at paper, they're actually looking at what's going on. Right? We've taken them and we've taken them down to where, for example, the telephony metadata program is actually done. 
And we've sat them down and we said, here's how it actually works in practice. Right? Tools, technology, software, and all. Um, because that helps connect these two ideas. Right? Seeing is believing, if you will. And again, you know, I wish I could take you all from here inside NSA and show you the same thing. I don't know how to do that. But I really would like to do that. Right? So to some degree, the elected representatives, the folks that stand in, right, my, I mean, I go home at night, I'm a private citizen too. And that's what I do. But the folks that stand in our stead, it's at least a good thing to make sure they are connected down. So they're not, we're not having mental disconnects between what the intent of a rule is and its actual implementation. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but that's at least the way I think about the question you asked from a compliance perspective. Um, we have a ton of, we, have a, we spend a ton of energy on this. This is really what I focus on. Other questions? There's got to be some. Yes? So uh, there is a recommendation as to move the data storage uh, outside the agency to say private agency, right? So in your opinion, can you list like one good strong advantage to that approach? And that I have less data to manage. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I that was one, am I done? No, just kidding. Go ahead. Because I can see that uh, trust takes a lot of time to build and you have these regulations and the glass in place and then uh, mistakes happen and then you trade on them and you build and you establish this strong uh, sort of regulation and then compliance. And if you sort of move it out now, start all over again and then you might have uh, error, issue, uh, mistakes happen all over again and then it trusts them. You just have a place to trust them this now. Yeah, so you, you um, kudos for you for realizing that some people once said to me, they said, once you move the data out, you have no more compliance things. I'm thinking, no, no, I have different compliance things. Right? I still have to make sure that the queries that go out, right, what questions are asked of the database, even if it's somewhere else, are proper. I have to make sure that when the things come, when results come back, that they're responsive to the question that was asked. I still have to make sure that the results that come back are handled in accordance with that set of information rules that govern rules, govern information as it flows all the way through. I have to make sure that it's only disseminated to the Federal Bureau of Investigation when it's appropriate because it has a counterterrorism nexus. All those things are still in play. And as you point out, right, uh, in compliance we speak a lot in terms of risk management. Change is always a, always presents a heightened risk. So just the mere act of changing something um, tends to heighten risk. All things being equal, right? I think um, you saw it from the uh, presidential review group. You saw it from the, um, you saw it from the um, various speeches by the administration and additional statements. You know, the path is to move it out. It does require an act of Congress, to go back to your question. It's not something that the executive branch can unilaterally do actually because we talked to a lot of lawyers and they've said you can't get here from there with current law. Um, so it does require that. I think the net, you know, doing the entire risk calculus, not having to manage a large set of data will take, auto, take off a lot of compliance risk. It's just inherent to that answer your question? Yes. So if you, if you have the data in-house um, I mean, not only do you, is the question of how, you know, how was access governed um, by a query system, you also have to, you also have the, I guess, opportunity to secure, store it as, as, as best as you, as you see fit. You know, you, you, you know, store it behind a you know, very secure facility behind, I don't know how many locks and firewalls and, and what have you. And, Scary looking people at the doors. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you, how do you maintain that if you were to move that data to a to an off-site or third party? Is that something that's governed by regulations, or is that something? Um, how do you make sure the, the same the, the same standards are maintained? Right. So my general rule is you can do the you can do compliance for the organization that you're in. Okay, it's very hard to do compliance for an organization that is physically separate by structure, et cetera. So you can do oversight of another organization in the sense of you can go in and inspect and look and all those kinds of things. So you, know, you asked a question, if the database is no longer, just the bulk telephony metadatabase is no longer in NSA and is stored somewhere else, right? Who's, where's the accountability flow? Where does the standards flow? That's, I think, a little bit different if it's back with the 
telecommunication providers that it came from. I mean, they've been, you know, that, that data started there. It came in to NSA, right? And then, you know, it, it's, we're not going like, to give it back. It'll just exist there. So, you know, they have security protocols, et cetera. You know, I'm sure lock things like that for where it is. But that's not something that you're definitely going to have sort of one organization's compliance program run compliance for another organization. That's, that's very hard to do. But, uh, I mean, given, this, given the sensitivity of the data in question, I mean, is that something you can't enforce somehow? I mean, that's, again, a, a regular. So I, I don't think it would come from NSA enforcement. It would come from higher level regulation in the US government or, or elsewhere to tighten up. And, and, but you, you see this all the time. You see credit card data, I mean, all different types of data, right, that nothing to do with NSA. I mean, take NSA out of the picture. There's all different types of data that the federal, state, local government have said are really important types of data and need to have additional or, or unique security requests. Um, on that note, uh, who in the government uh, is in a position to dictate towards these people? I mean, does the, I guess, A, who in the government is in a position to enact regulation about such topics? and be who in the government is informing uh, that decision-making process. Like, does the NSA have a role in saying, you know, we have these practices, we've developed these practices for ourselves, <coughs> and we think that uh, that sort of practice should be standard, not just for us, but across. So the NSA doesn't have any kind of widespread, you know, US, um, regulatory ability. We're, we're not really a we're not a regulatory agency the way you'd think of other agencies like Commerce or Treasury or something like that. So, um, what would come from the NSA would be just as you said, advice, lessons learned, you know, best practices. Those do come out of the NSA to various entities, um, right? Sometimes in the security world, sometimes in the um, you know, digital world, et cetera, to say these are the best practices. So I, I don't know the specific answer to your question of what particular regulatory body governs. Um, but I mean, so, so the NSA is part of the dialogue about this topic uh, within the government speaking with, and so like you will, like do you personally have contact with other? Uh, I do hang out with other chief compliance officers. I know it sounds like a really exciting time when a bunch of chief <laughs> compliance officers get together, but we do have professional associations. We gather, I was just at one in DC on Friday. So the short answer is yes, we spent a ton of time with other, mm -hmm. um, at least in the professional compliance officers uh, group, um, exchanging best practices. And so did I see another question here or there? Yes. I'm of an age that I have uh, fairly clear memories of the Nixon administration <laughs> and uh, the, uh, particularly the efforts that the Nixon administration uh, tried to get the FBI to get, to get dirt on their enemies, uh, and uh, I've, been thinking, I've been thinking about this question a little bit, so I don't want to put you on, on, a, on a spot that you, you, you can't. Oh, I've been on the spot. You can't put me on any more of a spot than I'm already on. Uh, <laughs> uh, that you know, a Ehrlich or Haldeman comes into a key person at NSA and says, Senator Smith, we've got to get his butt, and uh, that, that sort of thing. I would suspect that because of the huge size of this, that uh, that, that that sort of really totally illegitimate uh, and totally illegal ever could be it could be countermanded, but it's something that no, it's a great it's a great question. Um, kind of the, again the okay, you're you're set up, you're going right. We trust the bridge. We've seen the elephant walk across. We're all good, right? We've we've now paraded it. We're we're good. We're rock we're locked in. Even heavy machinery can go over this thing, but somebody dips in and says, "I want you to go do the wrong thing." Um, right. So the the standard mechanisms can play some into that. There are additional ones. Um, there, are more now than there, were there are more now than there were then. Um, the other thing is, and this is something that I get this question a lot, um, and to some degree, the complexity of what's going on is a feature, not a bug. Um, in the sense of, uh, you know, people sometimes think of NSA as like one database, one analyst, one report. You know, you get a piece of data and you write a report, you look at it, go at it. A lot of stuff is connected. The minute you change or do any activity, it's recorded and those logs are sent out and around. So it's very difficult to take a unilateral action that doesn't generate a trail of, of activity, right, in the sense of. Secondly, um, it's really, it, again, speaking of 
um, you know, liberty, security is a series of information rules, nobody controls that entire step from one person from A to B. So, um, you know, it, it would take a group of folks to carry out that. That's the idea of conspiracy law, which is it's really hard to get a group of folks to knowingly controvert something, right? I mean, history, again, back to Jeffrey Stone's things, history should teach us a lot, which is we should always be skeptical. We should always have that healthy skepticism. And the other thing is, right, there's a, you know, you can, there's a, there's a lot of, I think folks would line up at the inspector general's door and say, Houston, right, it's, we have a huge problem here. Okay, so what about cases that are not super obvious? For example, you know, there's, there's a whole spectrum between political opponent and the, you know, dangerous super radical, right? So, so where is the line here? Well, what about fringe political groups? So again, NSA is a foreign intelligence agency, so fringe political groups. What about fringe political groups outside of the US? Again, so, the, so you saw the president in Presidential Policy Directive 28 reaffirm a couple things. Right? Uh, so that was a policy directive. How many people read it? Um, I did. Uh, I've read it multiple times. Um, so that policy directive reaffirmed a couple things um, that are very important, one of which is that right, NSA does foreign intelligence. It does not target people. I, I don't have it in front of me. It does not target people for solely for their religious or you know, political or et cetera views. Right? That, that is not, we do not do economic advantage, those types of things. So again, there's a lot of um, reaffirmations of stuff that was already in there. You know, you're asking kind of the, I know you do, but there's a, there's a lot of, um, we had a good conversation earlier. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of things of a spectrum. Again, um, you know, it, it's hard to sort of answer generic questions about the spectrum. But again, anything we target has to have a foreign intelligence purpose. And it actually, and I haven't talked about this too much, it has to match an intelligence need, an information need that comes not from NSA, but from outside of NSA, from the policymakers right, who decide what are the nation's priorities for information to help either policymakers or military support. So again, you know, you, I don't see any of those things on the list. I see those lists. You don't see, you know. Yeah. Um. So it's my, my understanding that uh, the NSA has put back doors and routers that end up in foreign lands. How does that not make a whole lot of people vulnerable when you basically purposefully put um, a weakness in a technology that then you can't really control? And then from a compliance perspective, how do you really regulate that? So I'm going to have to punt a little bit on the first one just because it's a relatively news story out there, and I, I want to make sure I'm not getting out ahead of um, other remarks. Uh, second thing I would say is be very careful about confusing the capability of doing something with the actual, or the, the ability to gather information with then the second step of what information can be lawfully gathered through that method. And we, we see that a lot. So for example, um, right, do you have a answer or a question? A follow-up, right. So. Um, you know, we saw this, for example, people thought that just because somebody uses encryption, we could target it solely on the basis of them using encryption. That, that's not how the laws and policies work. Uh, you have to make sure there's a legitimate foreign intelligence need for going after a specific foreign intelligence right, target. Those, it, it's not just because there's access that then that opens up free game to use that access for anything. There's additional laws and policies. Like kind of like weakening the pylons and these bridges, like, you know, just kind of going out there and weakening the technology that exists, I don't see how that's beneficial for anyone. So I, again, I don't want to get too far out in front of, um, I, I, I'm trying to give you a really nice crisp answer. Do you have a crisp answer? No, but I've got a follow-up question. <laughs> uh, I, was, I, was on, I was in Germany yeah. on sabbatical last fall when the news came out that Bless Angela you. Merkel's yeah. phone, cell phone was being tapped. Um, it just seemed like somebody said, we can do this, we should. Somewhere, somewhere along the line should have said, if they ever find out, what's that going to do? It's going to destroy the last 60 years of good relations built up after the Marshall Plan and all this other stuff. Um, you know, before that, people were saying, ah, oh, yes, you're from the US. You know, I remember uh, you know, Quaker spies and various other stuff being fed, the kids being fed, um, all these wonderful thoughts. and. After that, it was just, what are you doing? Right. So again, and, and I'm I, just I asking, will, who should have, who should have said, 
yes, we can do this. So, but it's not smart. No, so I, I, I'm with you. The, the past is the past. The, let's focus on the who should have. And it's not no longer a theoretical question of who should have. It's now a who gets to. Right? And in, in section three of the Presidential Policy Directive 28, it outlines an entire thing about how to conduct a more risk assessment totality right, um, um, view as to not just can we legally or policy or does this satisfy an, an intelligence need, um, but is it taking into account the totality of the risk? Right? Again, risk of exposure, risk of from the State Department, from Treasury, et cetera, you, you name it, all those folks coming in and saying, is this really the right thing to do? You're seeing, if, you know, as you saw, that it, if you read carefully the Presidential Policy Directive, which I do, and I, you know, and I realize not everybody reads all these things, what you see generally is an escalation of um, decision making and risk management right, to higher level folks in the government, which I, you know, is a very natural and, and sort of normal. So um, how does the NSA as an organization handle these internal questions of, is this the right thing? Should we be doing this? Great. Um, so um, that is a wonderful question. Um, and, and one we've been putting a lot of time and thought into. And it, it stemmed, obviously, um, uh, from, our, our under, you know, from our desire to understand the difference between reporting what we would call, and again, some folks may scratch their head and say, I wonder why John's saying this. Um, the difference between reporting true fraud, waste, abuse, and contravention of a court order, let's say, to your point, sir, right back there. Of, right, the court order says A, somebody says do B. Right, that is, that's clearly kind of in one category. Right, the challenge with some of these programs, et cetera, is when you peer past the heat and the, you get to the light, you see a court order, you see a statute, you see right, approvals from the various branches of the government. You see right, that somebody's not going to walk in and say, hey, this document says to do A, and they're doing A. Right, that's not your typical sort of fraud, waste, abuse, and that. So, that leads us, and that led us to a number of discussions. We had a number of um, sessions across all of NSA to figure out the best way then to have kind of the, hey, I just have a question um, about, is this the right thing to do? Um, or I don't understand. One of the things we found was, and this was not because even we were not you know, hiding something within the NSA. We just didn't communicate it out even inside the NSA. So there were some people inside the NSA that said, I didn't know you were doing this. Right? I didn't know there was a program that collected telephone records, even with all the legal strictures and, you know, I'm a compliance guy, so even with all the compliance safeguards to make sure we comport with that law, I didn't know. And so it goes beyond I have a question to we now have, and I'm, I'm about to start this with a couple other of my peers, we're going to go around and tell people here's all the authorities we operate under, right? Here's, we have a new civil liberties and privacy officer, here's the kind of here's how we ration and, and, and reason into different privacy protecting decisions and then here's the compliance regime that goes on. So we start with one just knowledge. Second question then is um, and we're working now we have a series of kind of ethos seminars and, and briefings to get folks to understand different mechanisms for asking not just their, man I mean their management is obviously the first line of discussion but other folks you know I, I've now had some folks come to me already and say I just want to understand this better. I have questions. Why is that? And I always make time for those folks um, and, and others across the NSA are. Does that, does that address your question? OK. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, you know, if, it, if it is you know, truly or folks really say, I'm still not getting my answer, they can always go to the IG. They can always go to Congress. They can always go elsewhere outside of the building. They can even do so internally, anonymously, or, or not anonymously, however they want to. Um, and, and again, even the other parts, like the Inspector General, will follow up on a complaint that isn't just about, for example, fraud, waste, and abuse. Or something. So has, has there been changes in this, in that, in that space post-Snowden? Very much so. And again, it, it really, just to be clear, a lot of it starts with just common understanding. Right? I mean, I, you know, I think, well, I mean, I don't think this is a uniquely NSA thing. My guess is if you picked anybody in any organization and said, do you know everything this organization does? They'd say, probably not. Right? Um, but when you have suddenly the international world watching you and your own nation, you know, that, that it becomes even more concerned. I mean, folks at NSA were having hard times sitting down with their friends and family, right? getting appropriately grilled, right? but having dis difficult discussions and them saying, well, you know, I didn't really know we were doing that. And 
they tell me it's fine, but I'm not sure. I don't have any independent um, knowledge, and that's right. That's a that's a challenging point. We even gave our NSA folks talking points. We said, here's the following things that might help the discussion, and then we got excoriated for doing so. So you know, you, you can't win. Right. So questions? Yes. <laughs> yeah, your talk here today, Mark. Uh, what else is the NSA doing to provide for greater transparency without an injury as intelligence Great. Um, and so that's, that's, couldn't have framed it better. Uh, there's a couple things we're doing. Um, one is, and, and this was interesting, um, is one, we're just trying to get out more of what the rules are. Uh, so again, they're, they're dense, they're legal, but just the fact that those are out thing. Here we go. Before right, this, I used to go out and talk about compliance. And at one point, I got to an interview with a reporter, and she looked at me and she said, I, I get this compliance stuff, whatever, it's kind of boring, but you know, I'm having fun talking to you. Um, but what are the rules? Like, what can you and can't you do? And I said, well, unfortunately, they're still class they're classified. So, so that's one. Let's get past that. Second is, um, and this is something our um, civil liberties and privacy officer, um, Becky Richards, um, I don't know if anybody noticed that NSA appointed a civil liberties and privacy officer, but we did. Um, she has, uh, that office has put out a description of, for example, how the, um, the PRISM program that you may have read about, how that actually works, some of the controls. There's other additional things that will be coming out from that office. Again, not in legalese, or attempting not to be in legalese, attempting not to be, um, but kind of how it works at a Civics 101 kind of schoolhouse rock. This is how a bill becomes a, right, this is a bill on Capitol Hill, here's how it moves through. Um, to make sure folks just understand what is done, what is not done, some of the, some of the safeguards. Um, the other thing just our office and others are working on is, um, and I know Danny Weitzner was up last, did he talk about the compliance balance sheet? Yeah, yeah. yeah so actually, um, so it's one of the things we're working on as well, um, which is, and again, just real quick, if you think about financial accounting, um, there's this wonderful idea, I think Danny talked about this, that you can look at a balance sheet of an organization you can get some insight into how that organization is doing. We're trying to do the same thing for compliance so that we don't keep having to say, I mean, again, I love reading you Jeffrey Stone's thing, but in the future I'd like to be able to not just read you what somebody else who came into NSA said about, I'd like to be able to show you, right, something that is not just from us but is audited by others to say, here's actually how we did actually following the rules. So I realize we're over time and I, I don't want to, Keep a captive audience. I, I, I really thank you all for being here. I don't know, Sean, I look to you. I'm, I'm happy to stick around. Let's see. Um, be just one more quick question and then, uh, then we'll let Sean here. Okay. okay. So everything you're saying points to there, from an impression that there has been a tremendous improvement in how NSA works post Snowden. Doesn't that mean it, it's been a great thing? So I, I, tremendous is probably a, a generous statement from you. I'm, I'm, I'm taking that. Um, I think, right, and, and you've, heard, you've heard other officials say this, that hindsight in 2010 hindsight, right, hindsight, this is truly 2010 hindsight, there are things that had, right, they just been, even just fact of, hey, this is what's going on, not to your point, right, of getting into oh, by the way, here's the little details of what's going on. But the mere fact of the activities that NSA was doing, right, had they been put out there in a less heat way with more light, right, that that would have, that would have materially changed the, some of the, some of the um, right, shock surprise. Right. I, I do think, you know, there, um, our, our former deputy director said, look, you know, when somebody burns down your house, Right? You can still be mad at the guy that burns down your house or whatever, you know, you know, whatever, that's his words. But it does allow you a chance to rebuild your house a little better. Um, right? And so, not that you can ever separate those two things, but that's maybe the, sep the, the kind of, uh, you know, that's not me, that's, uh, that's, that's our former deputy director. Um, but I think it's a nice way of thinking about it, which is, look, you know, stealing a bunch of classified documents and running out with them is against the law. Right? There's no way around that. That's just a fact. Right? The chance to learn, be a learning organization, to right, make improvements, right, to have this discussion. I mean, we're, you know, I, I think the big data discussion was, you could see it building up, not just even within NSA, just across society. I mean, I think the fact that you're hosting a session with 
folks that aren't just about NSA is great. Um, you know, we kind of were the place where the, the big, we went into burst transparency mode. Um, you know, now we're trying to figure out how to do better transparency mode that's, you know, we, I mean, I was one of those folks that went out and talked about metadata the first couple months and everyone looked at me like, everyone's nodding their head and I'm thinking they understand and then they're like, what is this thing? It sounds scary. It sounds worse than data. It sounds like, you know, sort of, uh, metadata. Uh, so, anyway. Thank you very much. Okay.